Welcome everyone to uh, this program of Ascend TV Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnett. And today our guests are Lena Fancy and Brian Siegel of the Autism Center for Northern California. And before we get into that though, Will, what's with your shirt today? This week's, sh this episode, I'm wearing my Tennessee sh Titan, sh my, my Tennessee University shirt. I'm wearing this in honor of my, uh, my new cousin, Carolyn Elaine Watkins, who was just born last Wednesday. Well, thank you, Will. Would you like to get into uh, your questions with our guests now? Tell us about your background in the autism community. I, under I understand you've been, you have been working with children and, and adults with autism since 1972. How did you come to this field? Well, that's correct. And, uh, you know, I first started when I was a college student and I worked... Uh, my first place that I got to work with people on the autism spectrum was a place called Creedmoor, Queens Children's Hospital in New York City. And it wasn't a very nice place for kids to live. And after that, I worked in a place called uh, Elwin Institute, which was a beautiful school out in the country, which was a nice place for kids to live. And I began to think about what, what is really autism and what is really uh, problems kids might have from the way they were being raised. And it was pretty interesting to me. So I, uh, I wrote my thesis on it in college. And then when I uh, finished my uh, doctoral training at Stanford, I got a chance to start to understand, you know, what goes on with people with autism, how much of this is learning style and how does it compare to how other kids who aren't autistic learn and, um, became my life's work and I've been doing it ever since. Uh, I was a professor at UCSF for 25 years and founded and ran the autism clinic there. Uh, before that, I founded and ran the first autism clinic at Stanford. And um, along the way, I've written five books on autism and published many scientific papers and chapters and worked on the diagnostic criteria, including for stuff like Asperger's syndrome, which is a diagnosis I know everybody in your group knows that's come and gone. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll uh, that's, that's the work I've done. And when I retired from UCSF, um, I started the Autism Center of Northern California. Lena, who's going to talk about Jumpstart today, um, was already running Jumpstart, which was a program I'd started as a research project as a professor at UCSF. And she kind of took it and made it into something real that really helps families. And um, then she and I together expanded it into the Autism Center of Northern California. Tell us about the, about the Autism Center of Northern California. What services do you provide to the autism community? Well, one of the things that I didn't get to do much at UCSF was to, to be able to help families who don't have a lot of money. And so we have contracts with Medi-Cal to see kids who live in San Francisco and Alameda and Contra Costa County, and most of the counties south to Monterey and most of the counties north to Oregon. And um, so we serve a lot of families who wouldn't have access to high quality diagnosis and treatment planning. Um, so that's part of what we do. And Jumpstart Lena's gonna talk about. And then Launchpad, I'll mention a little later when I talk about what we're hoping to be able to do in the next few years in terms of starting programs for young adults. Lena, tell us about your background and how you came and, and how you came to this field. I started uh, working in autism in 1999. So it's been over two decades now that um, I have been working with um, children on the spectrum as well as their families. I um, wanted to originally go into art therapy. Um, I was doing some work with learning disabilities and ADHD, um, but autism was really where I felt most aligned, comfortable. I was able to connect um, very easily and that was really important to me. I did start um, in ABA in Toronto, which is where I'm from. Um, and I did, um, provide services via the ABA model. I found it a little restrictive um, and a little rigid in regards to the way that they were working with children. And so I was much more interested in a much more a naturalized um, program. So, 
you know, when I, when I moved to the Bay area around seven or eight years after I started working in autism and I met um, Bryna um, who was at UCSF and she was really talking about how the family needed to be supported holistically. You know, there was a lot of situations where, you know, tutors were coming in and working with children, but parents weren't being trained on these strategies. And it was much better for the child as well as the family if everybody was trained on strategies and ways of, of helping a child communicate, a child learn to play, a child, you know, who needed to feel a little bit more comfortable in, in certain environments. And so that was really important to me. So when I heard about Bryna's program, jumpstart you know i immediately thought it was brilliant i i fell for it and um it was it has been an incredible honor for you know the last 15 years or however long it's been um to be able to work with bryna to be able to work at the center and mostly to be able to work with all these families who i really feel like i can i can help you know, at the beginning of a journey and, you know, mostly um, for the children who are navigating, you know, trying to learn skills and, and trying to go to school and trying to make friends and helping them as much as I can. Thank you, Will. We'll now hear from our cultural correspondent, Stacey Kennedy, uh, who has a few questions for our guests. Yeah, I have a, I have a question for the, the two of you. Um, what are the main challenges that you see for young adults um, with autism? Well, I can, I can take a crack at that first. Um, I think one of the problems is that there is a big disconnect um, for what's taught in school and what prepares people for life after school. And um, of course, when we talk about autism, we're talking about a few different, very different groups of people. So we have the people who have autism who also have some degree of intellectual disability who we need to prepare them with just being able to take care of themselves and be part of their family and be part of their home life and feel as independent as possible. But uh, much of what we've focused on and what I know Ascend works with is, you know, young people who um, are going to finish high school or finish college and um, often have missed out on the early kind of job readiness skills that high school kids get, you know, working at a beach club or uh, working at a McDonald's and, um, you know, come out, uh, come out ready to work, but really don't know about showing up on time and how you dress for work and uh, coming every day and how you relate to coworkers. And so that's another whole piece that I often see really bright people getting tripped up by not having the skills to do that stuff. And so, what we're trying to do now is focus on what I call 10 year plans. So if you're you know, 12, we should be thinking about what will you be able to do when you're 22? And let's look at the road you followed from two to 12, that 10 years. And what does that tell us about where you're gonna go from 12 to 22? And what skills are you gonna need to be the best 22 year old you can be? And I think a lot of times we're not as realistic as we should be. It's like, you know, when you have a four-year-old, having a four-year-old believe that they could be an astronaut someday is great, um, but really not many people are going to be astronauts. Um, and so at some point we need to think about what you can really do, and we might not know, but so I've developed this rule, and the rule is actually to start low, you know, just get the easiest job you can get, uh, feel successful at it, go slow, um, do that for a while until you're really ready for something else, but go as far as you can go. So start low, go slow, but go as far as you can go. And that's kind of the rule we're using in the Launchpad program. But we're trying to find good ways to, you know, do testing to understand how different personalities and different uh, job aptitudes are going to make people happier in different lines of work. So that's another big focus of the launch pad idea. You know, when I, when I first meet families um, and they bring their child in, the first thing I like to talk about are strengths. That's not always the case, um, you know, when, you know, you have to go and get an assessment or you're going into an educational placement or you're even going to an IEP meeting. You know, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, 
what a child can't do. Um, and yet I, I think there needs to be a little bit of a cultural shift to discuss what they can do. And I think in this climate, it's especially important to be able to really talk about inclusion, inclusion in community, inclusion in the workforce, inclusion in social settings, you know, and, um, and that's for any, any differences, um, you know, whether we're talking about ability, you know, race, gender. I mean, I think it's a very, very important topic um, coming out of the last couple of years. And I think that hopefully COVID has been an experience where as we come back into society after being somewhat isolated, you know, talking about inclusion for everything, especially for young adults coming back into, you know, community and social situations, I think there also needs to be a focus on that. Yeah, I think another thing that you can pair with that, Stacy, is that, um, I think we need to focus more on strengths. And when Lena was talking about IEPs, everybody sits around and talks about weakness. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little experience I had about, I don't know, maybe six or seven years ago, I was very involved with a school here in San Francisco called uh, Stern School, which my son had gone to many years earlier. And it's a school for kids with learning disabilities. And one of the moms at the school was a well-known uh, singer, Linda Ronstadt. And Linda gave money to put together an arts festival one year. And then she made a speech and everybody thanked her. And, and she said, you know, the reason I did it is that kids with learning differences always are being hammered on what they can't do. And I wanted them to spend time working on what they could do. It reminds me My of that dad. song, Different Drum, since you brought up her uh, name, yeah. Lena, could you tell me, uh, excuse me, Lena, could you tell our viewers a little bit more about the Jumpstart program with our young children? So the Jumpstart program is really, I consider a revolutionary program in the field. Bryna started it at UCSF years ago and um, we kind of extricated it and turned it into a nonprofit. Um, and what it really focuses on is, is supporting both children and their families, um, either just prior to a diagnosis or once they get a diagnosis of autism. Um, and it's really a mechanism to, it, it does a number of things. The first thing that it does is it re, we really try to educate parents as much as we can on what does it mean to get a diagnosis? What is autism? There's many parents who come in who've never even heard the word before. And if they have heard the word, there's a lot of misconceptions just from the lack of information that goes along with that word. So it's almost giving them the information that they need to hear and also specific to their child. As we've discussed, you know, autism can look like many different things, right? So making sure that we identify their child's strengths. And I always, again, focus on that first, their areas of need, you know, things that might be more difficult for them and why that might be more difficult for them. One of the conversations that I have is, you know, in a, in a lot of, in a lot of ways, children who don't um, kind of developmentally start to acquire language, you know, um, at the time where we see other children acquire language, they can kind of retreat into what I call of a, a little bit of a bubble. You know, they're there, but they're a little bit um, reserved. They're not interacting. You know, there's the lack of eye contact. There's, there's a lot of escape-based behaviors that for, for parents who've never been exposed to this, they don't really know how to help. They don't know how to um, really make the environment a little bit more comfortable for a child who might be having difficulties. And because of that, you know, the, the isolation that a child may experience, the difficulty in really learning how to communicate because of those hardships are just somewhat exacerbated just because of the lack of knowledge. And so being able to really teach a parent, you know, how to talk to their child where it might make the response a little bit easier, how to play with their child in a way where it, it's not overwhelming you know, how to join and then maybe expand instead of trying to change everything or teach everything where, you know, it could really, 
you know, I think I'd escape too. <laughs> you know, it's it's a lot of information for for a little child to be constantly kind of bombarded. So really learning the the gentleness of interaction, learning the importance of motivation, um, and really how to follow a child's lead to help them develop and help them use their strengths to perhaps develop their areas of need, right? So that is a fundamental ideology of Jumpstart. And the way that we do that is the family works with myself as, as the behavior con consultant, um, where I'm not talking about behavior in terms of you know, tantrums or, you know, although that is definitely included, but behaviors just in terms of foundations of being able to interact, imitate, follow directions, you know, be learning ready, be responsive, and how can we help that process? You know, then they meet with a speech therapist. Um, you know, one of the main concerns for a younger child um, on the spectrum is there are typically some communication difficulties. So meeting with a speech therapist um, can be very helpful for families in regards to not just taking their child to a speech therapist for an hour a week, but learning some of those strategies to implement within the household mm -hmm. so that child can get help all the time, right? So it's not limited to these short one hour sessions, but a parent can actually learn. Um, and that also brings the relationship and the bonding between you know, that parent and that child to a different level when you can really communicate and help and you know how to do it, you know. And then the third component um, is working with a play slash floor time coach because it's not just ABA. ABA is not the fix all, right? It is, it is helpful. There's core principles of ABA, which can be very effective, but there also needs to be naturalized strategies. There also needs to be play strategies. You know, let let the children play, let the children learn how to play. And that also then strengthens the bond between children and their parents. Right. So and then the, the week is finished off with the family meeting with Bryna, um, who does a, a great psychoeducational piece as well as talking about education. And so we leave the family with a, a roadmap, because as a parent, um, not knowing how to help your child is likely frightening, right? So when you have that information and you can actually help your child develop, I think that is the best gift that we can get, give to parents and families and being able to make a child more comfortable and um, allow them to access that interaction and that play and that speech is again, probably the biggest gift that we can provide. So that, that is Jumpstart in a nutshell. Sounds like a, a wonderful program for all. And along those lines, Lena, what have you found to be the biggest challenge uh, with the families and within the program? There's a lot of challenges. I mean, especially now because of COVID. Um, and I'll talk about those two separately. You know, some of the challenges, again, is a lot of lack of information and a lot of preconceived notions of what autism means. Um, it, I think, you know, going back to my previous statement about inclusion and acceptance, you know, the more information and the more education we can provide, the easier it is to accept. Acceptance on so many different levels, right? So there is, you know, one of the things that I see happening for families is it's very difficult, you know, when you're faced with a crisis and you don't know what to do. It's also very easy to fall prey to perhaps well um, intentioned comments like, oh, you know, they'll be fine or they'll talk in full sentences when they're five or, um, you know, they're getting a lot of pressure from perhaps family members, perhaps other caregivers, perhaps teachers, perhaps even doctors who may not have all the information that's necessary. So really the challenge I find is really getting parents and families in the door. Um, thankfully, we work with regional centers that have supported this program, especially you know GGRC in San Francisco that have supported this program for families. But I really feel like this is something that almost every family should receive 
um, when they have a child who's perhaps developing on a slightly different trajectory who may need some assistance. It is so important. So I think the challenge doesn't come so much from the family themselves because you know almost every family wants help and will take the help and need the help. It's more the institutions around this, um, which is really limiting their ability to access it. Brian, I understand the uh, center does a great deal of uh, diagnostic tests. Could you tell our viewers a bit about those? Yeah, um, well, we, we do a lot of diagnostic testing for a number of agencies and it's important to get a diagnosis, but often parents don't understand why. And what, a lot of the work that I've done over the years has to do with what I call autistic learning styles and autistic learning disabilities. In other words, if you look at the specific check mark, which symptoms of autism does this individual seem to have, they also mean certain things about how they do or don't process information and what they are and are not likely to understand as easily as other people. And so to me, it's a roadmap to the kind of things we want to take out of our autism treatment toolbox, if you will, um, for strategies for developing programs. So to me, diagnosis is the first single step. The second step is designing programs around an individual's strengths and weaknesses. And the third step is what I call, what is follow-up. Just in other words, a lot of parents, the model of diagnosing autism came from university centers where you get diagnosed, and uh, I call it diagnose and adios. Um, parents never go back there again with their child. And they may have been told that they need <clears throat> 30 or 40 hours a week of ABA and off you go. And that doesn't mean that's what they still need. When they, if they needed it when they were three, they might not need it when they're five, but they might need it when they're five. And probably is not what they need when they're 10. And it certainly is not what they need when they're 15. But I think it's important that we're trying to develop a model so that at different forks in the road in development, parents can come back and understand that based on how their child's been able to learn and what kind of resources they've accessed, what comes next, what makes sense to do next. And so care continuity and what in medicine is called a medical home, just the way if you had a child who wasn't autistic but was diabetic, you'd have a doctor to go back to all the time to ask about how the diabetes problems affect their ability to go to school and when they have a cold and everything, what to eat. And we need to have something like that for autism too, a medical home. Will, would you like to give uh, our guests your concluding question? How has working with the autism community affected your view of autism? Well, I, I'll try to go first on that. Um, I think that a lot of what we've already said answers that already, which is that I think both, both of us feel very strongly that working with the autism community is working with the autism community. We're not just working with the person with autism, we're working with their family, we're working with their school, we're working with everybody that has anything to do with trying to provide supports and education and recreation or everything. And that it's all about having everybody on the same page, understanding what kinds of um, what kinds of support and what kinds of, of leisure, what kind of living situations, everything um, is a part of what I would call the autism community. And we need to involve ourselves in making all of that as high quality as possible. So I think for for myself. You know, I've been in the field for 20 years. Um, I have family members on the spectrum. Um, I've had the privilege of working with, you know, probably over 100, if not hundreds of families at this point. Um, and I think for me, what I've understood about autism um, and those on the spectrum and their families is that I think it's really important to celebrate strengths. I think it's really important to support areas of need. And I think we really have to push for education, acceptance and inclusion in all facets moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Bryna and Lena, 
you have given us a very informative and actually an inspiring talk. Uh, how can our viewers find out more about the Autism Center for Northern California? www.acnc.org. Excellent. And there's a Yelp page for Jumpstart Learning to Learn in San Francisco, if anyone is interested to read that as well. We'll now hear from our cultural correspondent, Stacey Kennedy. Thank you, Keith. Autism Awesomeness with uh, Karen Kaplan will be... Um, Usually it's at the Bayview Church in San Rafael, but it will be, um, this is the second year that we're going to have to do it like online. And so anybody who has talents or you know anyone with talents or publications, any articles, songs or books you want to share, send a video to uh, Karen Kaplan at karensupportsu at comcast.net. You can also go to Karen's website, www.karenkaplanasd dot com so again autism awesomeness which happens towards the end of april thank you very much stacy mm -hmm. we'll now hear from jennifer brooks our book correspondent thank you keith today's book is life animated this is a book by political commentator owen suskind he once worked for the, the washington post or the wall street journal i'm not sure exactly what some major newspaper based in Washington, D.C., and this is about his son, Owen, who is on the autism spectrum and did not learn to speak until a relatively late age, much later than most, than is typical for most other children. He began showing symptoms at age three, which was just after the family moved from Massachusetts to Washington, D.C., and, you know, at first the symptoms were a little bit subtle, so they were dismissed as, oh, he's just having trouble adjusting to the move, but once he adjusts, he'll be fine. Well, he wasn't fine until many, many years later. He did eventually learn to speak with the help of Disney movies. The reason it's called, the book is titled Life Animated is because it talks about Owen's strong connection with animated movies produced by Disney and some other animation studios, but mostly Disney. That's what he tended to fixate on. And Owen himself, when he grew older and was able to describe what was happening inside his mind, explained that when he heard, you know, just, people talking, his family in everyday life, the speech was so garbled to him that he couldn't make any sense of it. But the animation, he could understand, for one thing, because it always follows the same script, and for another thing, because in hand-drawn animation, at least, the facial expressions tended to be exaggerated. For most of us, that's just for comic effect, but for Owen, that was crucial in helping him understand both what the characters were saying and why they were saying it. So at first he would just have a phenomenon called echolalia, which is just repeating sounds that he heard and nobody really knows if they understand what they're saying or not. But eventually Owen did learn to understand and was able to begin communicating first with his family. There's a pivotal scene when his father took on the role of Iago, the parrot from the movie Aladdin. And Owen was able to respond as Aladdin and they were able to repeat dialogue to each other. And that's how the father and son began communicating. Life Animated was made into a film in 2016. This features Owen as a young adult in his twenties transitioning from a special needs high school into semi-independent living. You know, he has his own apartment, but there are there's a caseworker there if he needs 